There's a bunch of people who start the Christmas season early. Too early by most others' estimations. Some claim it's mostly commerce driven. Not always. Believe it or not, I've heard of a family who starts their Christmas May 1st. True story. And it's very difficult for them to wait even that long to begin the preparation for the celebration of that blessed event that they just celebrated four months prior. So you may be a two weeks before, three weeks before, the day after Thanksgiving, May 1st. Just know this, the one true God started early to prepare for the birth of the Messiah, earlier than any one story you've heard. I'll start with his actions about a thousand years before. More than five centuries before the birth of Jesus, the prophet Daniel was exiled to Babylon in the first wave of Jewish exiles. There, he rose to a high-ranking position among the Babylonian astronomers and sages. It is very likely that his teachings would have been known by every following generation of these wise men. A thousand years before Jesus was born, King David ruled over Israel, the height of its glory. He defeated virtually all of the surrounding nations, instilled peace in the region, gathered an enormous amount of wealth. Yet Jesus said that David acknowledged a day would come when a new Lord would rule. And Jesus strongly indicated that he was that Lord. Several prophecies in the Old Testament testified that the Messiah would be a descendant of King David. For that to happen, God had to keep the line of David alive through all of the upcoming disasters that were to befall Israel. And there were a lot of them. Babylon, the Babylonians conquered Judah, the southern kingdom. They wiped out Jerusalem, took all of the prominent Jews into exile. At that time, it appeared to be the end of the existence of the Hebrew nation. This would include the kingly David line. However, God planned for the Israelites to be in exile for only about 70 years, at which time they would return to Israel. While the Israelites were in captivity, they became familiar with the Babylonians. More importantly, the Babylonians became familiar with the Israelites and their God. Then the Persians defeated the Babylonians, and that meant that the Persians became familiar with the Israelites and their God. The Babylonians and the Persians were the repositories of knowledge and great wisdom, information and advanced technology in that part of the world. In those cultures, anything they learned was sure to be written down, cataloged, remembered, and used at the appropriate time. Their records went back to the time writing was invented. I am one of the wise men, a magician or magi of the Babylonians and Persians in the time of Jesus. You can learn of my predecessors in the book of Daniel. The magi revere wisdom and knowledge. Of all the wise men in Babylon and Persia, Daniel was the wisest. You can be assured that we captured as much of his wisdom as we could and have studied it through the ages. My predecessors learned firsthand from Daniel that the God of the Jews is the most powerful of all gods. Our prideful king, Nebuchadnezzar, went from threatening to kill Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to witnessing a mind-boggling miracle that none of us could explain. The king praised God and defended all Jews. Throughout Daniel's life, we continue to learn the unmatched power of the one true God of the Jews. Something else the Magi learned from the Jewish prophets. One day, a Savior will come. We don't know when, we don't know who the Savior would be, but we would watch the signs and study world events so that when that Savior appears, we will be able to worship Him. And with our fabulous wealth, we expect to take lavish gifts to this long-awaited Savior. Based on historical precedent, the Magi naturally assumed the coming Savior would be an earthly king, or at least a very prominent military general or politician. The hopes of the Magi were first sparked when Alexander of Macedonia ascended to the throne at the age of 20. Alexander the Great. Rumors of his wisdom and military prowess reached us immediately. We dispatched three Magi to be observers. We learned that Alexander had acquired much of his wisdom from his famous tutor, Aristotle. We believe that if he chose to couple his earthly wisdom with godly wisdom, he could be the savior of the Jews. Only two years after becoming king, Alexander invaded one of the greatest kingdoms of the world, the Persian Empire. 
in two decisive battles, he overthrew Darius II and conquered the Persian Empire. In 334 BC, at age 22, Alexander controlled all of the land from Greece to Persia, including the land of Israel. This was the critical point for the Magi. Would Alexander turn his attention to Israel or to other matters? It didn't take long for us to be disappointed. Alexander continued his military ways and spread his empire to India. He and his followers were only intent on spreading the culture of the Greeks, which they did. Ironically, Alexander the Great died in Babylon, where the Magi have always lived. It is in my lifetime before an earthly king catches attention of the Magi again. The Roman Emperor, Augustus. He has led such a charmed life and is doing such powerful deeds that it can only be that the Jewish God is guiding his footsteps. In just a few decades, he has consolidated Rome's power over vast distances. There is peace throughout the empire and little political bickering. People are more prosperous than ever before. The Greek language of Alexander the Great is the international language, so all can communicate easily. For the first few years of his rule, we watch him closely. How will he treat Israel? Basically, he treats it like any other country of the empire, but does seem to give the Jews of Israel a few extra privileges. Most likely those are done out of expediency in keeping the peace, not because he has any special love for the Jewish people. We conclude that Augustus is not the savior of the Jews, but that God is surely using Augustus to prepare the world for the Jewish savior. We can divine that there is only one earthly king left who has the potential to be the savior of the Jews. Ironically, the Romans already made this man the king of the Jews. His name is King Herod the Great. Herod has ruled over Israel since 34 BC, about three decades. The country is prospering more than it has been since the time of King David. His magnificent building projects are second to none. Caesarea, Herodium, the Temple Mount, Masada, and more. Israel has become one of the critical hubs of world commerce because of Herod's building projects. We, the Magi of Babylon and Persia, who have been at watch with wisdom handed down over centuries and centuries, have heard rumors that King Herod is declining mentally, but is still capable of rebelling against the Romans if he chooses. The time is now of Herod the Great is to prove he is the savior of the Jews. We can't imagine any other alternatives if the savior is to come in our lifetimes. Because of Rome's oppression of the Jews, it makes sense that the Savior will come soon. We've heard rumors of people claiming to be the Messiah, but none of them are proven to be viable. My colleagues and I fully believe the Messiah will come in our lifetimes. God has been preparing the world for the coming of the Savior of the Jews, the Savior of the world. In the meantime, we wait for it to happen, wait for a sign or a sign that the savior of the Jews has appeared. We expect to be heading to King Herod's palace soon, the Magi. We have our three camels packed with lavish gifts to give him. We're prepared to acknowledge the long-awaited savior of the Jews. <laughs>